Massachusetts follow the gate, then the legislature reauthorized the 2004 federal ban, lifted it after 10 years because it wasn't reauthorized. And in June, uh, or July, you, you said um, some of those weapons that were allowed to be sold in the county of Alabama were not illegal. Yes, but the only clarification I offer is it's allowed to be sold. There was no determination by the government in one way or another with respect to what guns qualify as copies or duplicates under the 1998 law. So while it is true there was no enforcement of that term during those preceding years, there also was no uh, permission or other uh, interpretation or act by the Attorney General or any other. Do you have a gun permit? I do not. So, uh, I, uh, I'm reading from the announcement that the AG made about the penalties change. They said that, uh, or you guys said there were 10,000 copycat assault rifles sold in Massachusetts last year alone. In the year preceding 2016, correct. And how many were sold in the previous seven? I don't know, but it's thousands. So we use the figure 10,000 a year? Is that the sort of a I just don't know, but uh, I have no reason to believe there was a spike. Okay. So that would mean 150,000 or 170,000 of the Colt AR-15s and Plasma Pop AK-47s were sold in the time of Massachusetts. Um, no. I hope that the Colt AR-15s and AK-47s were not sold because those are specifically enumerated prohibited weapons. What was sold in New York was the copies or duplicates of them. So they would have been a Colt manufacturer, they could manufacture, there were other manufacturers who used the same functionality. What was the Colt AR-15 Automatic weapon or a semi automatic? It's a semi automatic weapon. And it's on the list. Both the federal statute and the Massachusetts statute have the list of enumerated weapons that are unlawful. And then both the federal statute and the Massachusetts statute said, uh, or copies or duplicates of the list of these weapons. So they those said two. They, they said that in 94. In, in 2000. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I guess. Why, why not? Why, why would thousands and thousands of these weapons be allowed to be sold in Massachusetts and other AGs were not? And all of a sudden now, it changes. Right. So that gets back to that initial charge from the Attorney General to her staff shortly after the trial began. Um, assess the risk here in Massachusetts style assault weapons. For instance, are they available? Are they sold? How frequently? And it was that process that, to my knowledge, for the first time, had law enforcement, the AGO law enforcement, looking at the sales in the past, these copycat, copycats of enumerated weapons. And, uh, but why did that occur? That occurred because of Attorney General determined after Orlando, after New Hampshire, after Aurora, after San Bernardino, that one of her priorities was <laughs> to address any public safety risks here in Massachusetts posed by these military style assault weapons. So, to my knowledge and my experience, the issue didn't come up in prior administrations, but I can only talk. When was New Town? Right. It was 2013. Who was the AG? Attorney General Cole. Yeah. I was there. When did Aurora? Uh, I think 2013. The, the 
ones I listed. criticism that I get from is that it seems to them anyway that all of a sudden out of the blue even the even the uh, incident you described in 2013 in 2016 10,000 were sold in 15, 16 and then we agree that many, many months All of a sudden, this out of the blue opinion came out. And people <coughs> say, well, it must be political. What do you say about that? So, in other words, the need was there early. The need was there from probably two, let's say, start with 2000. 2000 up to 2013, there were multiple shootings around the country at various times. The need for some sort of regulation. Least. And why, after allowing all of these weapons to be sold in the streets of town, does DAG all of a sudden have a press conference and say, I'm now going to say these weapons are illegal and that uh, they cannot be sold? Right? But why? It seems well, I've, I've people say it's political. Yeah, I've explained the motivation. I don't attach the edge. last in a series of those uh, mass shootings involving military-style assault weapons, causing the AG to ask for a scale. What, if anything, should we be doing about that here in Massachusetts? That was the motivation. That's what occurred. And we didn't know the answer to the question when it was first posed. 
question is, once you learn the answer and look at the text of copies of the legislative history the purpose of this, and then compare it to the types of guns that we then learned had been sold, what's the answer? You can do nothing because no one's active on or you can determine if the right thing to do is to, in our view, give the full measure of that law passed and the full protections intended to give them, make them reality in the power. The Attorney General chose the latter. I think it's really important to focus on how she chose to do it. Because once you make the determination that copies or duplicates means what it says and what the legislature intended, and that there are guns being sold, you had a bunch of choices. And I think she took the choice that absolutely took into account that there had been inaction on this issue for 18 years. Instead of bringing criminal charges against the men who possessed them, or the dealers who were up until July selling them, she took what I think was a much more correct approach, which is to advise the public and essentially grandfather those prior sales, even though it is our legal determination that those prior sales were unlawful. So I think she took into account that this was a new interpretation and enforcement. And that's why she implemented it the way she did, by not punishing those who already possessed it. And by, admittedly, on a date certain, saying this is how we're going to enforce it. And I think that was, A, much more fair than just starting with criminal charges. And B, much better than ignoring the problem. Okay, but we agree there's hundred or more thousand of weapons in the <clears throat> You have now said that those weapons are here. We're not gonna force any criminal penalties on anybody that owns them. Right? The enforcement of this makes it clear. They're illegal. Yes, they're illegal. And using our prosecutorial discretion, we will not take them back. Okay, if I own one, what, what can I do with it? Sell it? You can possess it. It's a private party. You can sell it. To a private party? Yes. And you can sell it to a licensed gun dealer. That gun dealer can only sell it to. So, the gun possessed in advance of the crime is essentially a gun. So, you can possess it. This is as a matter of prosecutorial discretion. You can possess it. You can sell it to a private individual or a gun dealer. You can sell it to a gun dealer. That gun dealer can sell it to someone for whom it is now being used, which is out of state or <laughs> That's what the concept of grandfather means. But it is an enforcement case. You know, I just I look at that and I say, okay, if we have over 100,000 of them sold in the last 18 years, and they're floating around the town lot, and I own one, I can go down and give it to my uh, friend, my uncle. Now he owns it, right? Correct. Right. And he can give it to somebody. I'm assuming that the issue is the parties that own it. Well, what if it's not? That goes to the enforcement notice. Okay, but, but if, if the enforcement notice was because of the tragedies that you enumerated in 2013, how does it help by leaving all of those guns on the street and in private hands? How does, it, how does that help? Somebody not getting their hands on them and using them in a way that doesn't create any distress. Well, the way it helps is stop them. Also, they can't be so since July 20, these copies of duplicates have been numerated, duplicates have been numerated, soft copies have not been sold. So that's the thing. I completely acknowledge it was imperfect. Because of the grandfather guns. But the reasons for that imperfect approach are that it is eminently more fair than bringing charges. 
markets with respect to those transactions, where we don't have to prove that those persons do or should. Illegal to possess a machine that does not stop. So if somebody has a machine gun, which I found in this case, so now the same people might they possess these illegal guns, but nothing happens to them. Stopping the spigot, but with at least 100 or 150,000 people floating around in the Hill County, how many were sold before all of this? It seems to me that there's a lot of these being gun shooters uh, around the Commonwealth now. So you turned off the spigot, but you have to think it's what you say is the problem. Also true, but now they're not being sold. Does that address the problem in the future? Of course not. But the reason that that was the approach is to take into account the factual aspects that you started this question, which is for whatever reason, for the first 18 years of the assault rifle, it was not enforced with respect to the sale of weapons. So that balance is part of the prohibition. I think the alternative would have been a much less correct approach. Uh, so tell me the difference between an automatic weapon and a semi Generally speaking, an automatic weapon is one pull of the trigger and will continue to shoot. A semi auto Loading is automatic, so it's not one pull of multiple bullets. It's single pulls, single pull, single bullet. But unlike other mechanisms, you have to summon a number of load and automatically shoots in this chamber. That's what a semi is. And then you have a handgun. Absolutely. So is the scheme here to uh, get those semi automatic weapons under our circuit? The scheme passed by the legislature in 1998 was to uh, not get them out of circulation, but not have them sold in the common law. And I say that because both the federal and the state in 1998 also grandfathered prior or made not illegal guns already possessed. So I would suggest that our enforcement notice approach, imperfect because in the interim there was uh, non-enforcement, took the same approach of stopping the sales and did not go back and seek to uh, bring charges against those who already possessed them. So it's roughly the same enforcement approach that's reflected in the federal state. Other than the cold AR-15 and the plasma drop that you said, are there other semi-automatic weapons like the Lincoln by the Commonwealth of Virginia? Yes. Well, the reason my understanding of the reason that the federal and state legislature chose because of the uh, lethality of the provision. Lethality, how the caliber and how quickly they can fire shots. Um, and there are others that are still semi-automatic, but the long pistols and long guns that are expressly included in the statute are still long guns. I presume that I mean, I will point to the notion of military style assault weapons to include those features that aren't included in the 
established that certain some guns were assault weapons and positions continue to make plus the copy of the plus the to apply features to these things. And our job is to enforce that. We have never sought to expand the arm. No, no, well, I'm just trying to, trying to get at the reason you say to me a legality weapon is semi automatic. Do you know, did you ever see the full AR? It looks I, like, it looks like an M16 that was used in Vietnam. Sure, the Supreme Court has noted that it is a civilian version of M16. And, but, but the difference is, a soldier's hand in M16 war is an odd thing. It's an odd thing, right? The AR-15 should not be an automatic. No, no, I think the legislature. The legislature made the judgment, both federal and state, that these 19 enumerated weapons that you're talking to were assault weapons. I can't shed some light on how they do these things. The legislative history of both the federal and state statutes say these guns are outlawed because, uh, one, they're designed for military style and they're specially designed. We've already talked about that. Two, well, they're well, disproportionate. They were, they're all legal, I completely understand. <coughs>
I got a nine millimeter Smith and Wesson automatic. I got the handle for it. So delivery system. Why isn't that in there? So it's not illegal because the legislature did it. If your point is that if the goal is to make sure legal guns aren't available in Massachusetts, there's no question that this statute is under inclusive. No, that's not my you said the goal of the AG's office is based on three tragedies that happened in 2013. Uh, and that's why this was not taking place in 2016 to prevent those kinds of tragedies. I, I want to disagree because I did explain how we got to this point and the motivation Attorney General to ask for staff who he was concerned about was those tragedies. No question. That doesn't mean that the reason we're enforcing the 1998 law is because of those tragedies. That was the motivating purpose. So we, looking, we came up with an answer and said it turns out that copies of enumerated assault weapons are being sold in Massachusetts. And starting with that premise, made a decision to enforce the existing law. So I, I, it's not that straight connection of three tragedies to this enforcement. No, no, okay, I get it. But what I don't get is, why not make the announcement, instead of just picking on these two weapons, and sending it automatically to schools and saying, you know, out there, legally, if you can go out and sell them, and handguns that can do the same damage. I mean, a good, a good shooter with a Send out about 70 or 80 rounds in a matter of half a minute, right? So, why wouldn't the AG say, Look, we've got to stop this. We don't have any more tragedies. These automatic, wet, semi automatic weapons, in fed, or whatever you're going to do with them, we've got to stop all of these. Instead of, I don't see the business <coughs> saying, Okay, we're going to pick these two and enumerate these. We know they're on the list. We know we should have been forced this for 18 years. But they match the same ones being sold legally all over the place. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Um, I, think I, have, I think I understand what you mean, Bill. But the determination is not to enforce the existing law with respect to these two particular laws. It was to enforce the existing law. Here are the only two sales. And it so happens that of those 10,000 sales, my understanding is the vast majority. AR-15 copycats, and that's much lesser than the AR-57 copycats. But the approach was not limited to those two things. I think that the Attorney General may have offered those examples, but that does not mean that the enforcement plan is Did something do a study in particular of 10,000 a year? That seems like a tremendous amount of, say, bolts, weapons and bolts in the state of Massachusetts every single that seems like a tremendous amount. I don't even think Smith and Wesson sells that many uh, nine millimeter pistols. That's it. And these wouldn't. These wouldn't. These aren't. These aren't called. They're copycats. But the same thing is true. Thank, thank you very much. Before I call, I, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, Council Casey, uh, Councilor uh, Kennedy, and Council Ferrara. And I would like to say, as I do when I preside, please do not use your cell phones. It is disrespectful to the nominee and to the questioner's uh, counselor and, uh, and to respect for this public process. Please, whether you're looking down at your at, at your um, Cell phones, <laughs> um, I ask that again. Okay, Councilor. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, guys. I don't have any questions. You know, Councilor Juvenville asked you a lot of questions about the prohibition. Uh, he's very knowledgeable, really passionate on that issue. And I just want to make sure I heard, I heard it correctly. If we have a uh, uh, Judge Barry Smith. If somebody is arrested uh, and they come before you, uh, is it, is it 
کشور My understanding is that when he was blogs for it, that he wouldn't put someone in a cage. Is that correct? Did I hear that correctly? Uh, I hope I understood the question. The council member was correct. Is someone uh, had a probation violation based on a thing about a blogging protest? And that was my understanding of the question. So okay. As opposed to, there's a, there could be a, the initial crime. Okay, so let's just go to the first part. Let's assume someone is arrested for possession of heroin. Uh, you can put these people in prison, or you can put them into a probe. <coughs> so, uh, I want to just take a moment to clarify the difference between probation violation based on. Yes, I understand the probation. So, so in, that, in the scenario where someone's coming to the court. I understand that part. When a probation violation is, they, uh, you might have sentenced someone for two years probation on the condition that they see the probation officer, clean urine, and all that. They violation, violate the terms of the probation. They, they failed the urine test. I heard you say then that, yeah, we wouldn't put them in jail. We wouldn't put them in jail. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, and my answer is not the same for a person who comes before the court with some crime. And I say that because the appropriate sentence for any crime is going to turn on a lot of factors, and even if there is a current conviction that may have played a role in the criminal conduct, one still has to take into account what the criminal conduct is. So right. I can't answer it in the same way. So I understand that part. Like someone could be a, uh, a B&E and yeah. they could have a drug. I mean, I got that. Right. But I'm talking about just a drug issue, nothing else. Uh, you know, just selling, uh, selling the stuff, using the stuff, you easily could send them to prison. Depending on circumstances, yes. Well, I, I mean, I believe in the right circumstances that making treatment part of the sentence, possibly diverting people from prison to treatment, but it all depends on the Okay, so the distinction is some going into the first, first offense or second or whatever, as opposed to a probation violation. And I heard you right. You know, Councilor June says, "Yeah, what if they come back two months, three months, four months? You know, I'm not somebody. Uh, I judge Barry Smith is very unlikely for a probation violation to put someone uh, in jail." The scenario where the only reason was a possible drug test. Let me ask this: If are you giving the right signal to someone who comes before you? Are they going to say? Defendant comes before you and says, Oh, this is great. You know, I'm put on probation. I'm not going to jail. And, hey, I don't have to worry about having a clean urine because Barry Smith, he, he, I mean, he's, he's the guy in the street. Never, never put you in jail. He, he, he's unlimited. Yeah, okay, we'll try this program. We'll try this. But hey, guys, you don't have to worry. Judge Barry Smith isn't putting us in jail. That's what I got from your question and answer between you and Julie. All right. Uh, yes, if I could just provide a little context. The same topic came up last Wednesday. In the hypothetical where we reached the third time, I said that I would listen to the probation officer because there may be reasons that at some point uh, a different approach is necessary. As you might expect, mm -hmm. I don't think I took issue with that, and I understand. But I said that then because. I don't think it's responsible to say that through every one of these crimes, that that would be my result. I do think that if the sole reason is addiction, is misuse, use of a substance, we should, a court should keep <coughs> trying to find ways to treat that addiction. I don't know that my patient is truly endless, and the question is more difficult. Times it happens, and other aspects of the conduct that are helpful. I, I just want to add one other thing. But my spouse won't appreciate it. She pointed out at lunch that she has many.
heard you were true. Depending on the circumstances, oh, I, think that's true. I think that's true. And I can listen to the tape, but I'll mention it to counsel too. But my, my clear impression was the first time you're not going to prison, the second time you're not going to prison. Is that right or maybe not right? I definitely said that. Yeah. And you can change the answers. I just want to make sure it's right. right. Well, he's I gone. I said that. And I, I said that. He is away. I said that, and I also said I tried to find another uh, lever uh, approach that's going to get that truth. So I, I, I don't think it's a matter of the answer is always the same. But I'd be willing to put in the effort to think of the additional conditions that might make the difference. Forever? I'm not sure. I got it. But I just hope, I mean, as long as you're consistent with your answer that at least the first two times, maybe you'll have different approaches, as you said, but it will not involve jail. And that would be it. You said, maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll do this. Uh, you'll have a different approach. At least the first two, no jail. That's different because that you, you you did. Uh, I don't know if this my is, is no. If this is changing my answer, then I want to change my answer. Okay, no, that's fine. Just my don't. inclination. I think I said this in response to the first one. I'm obviously not a judge. I would listen to everything you were telling me if I were a judge, based on the question that was posed. It was the only basis for the violation. It was drug use. My inclination. I said that the first time, and then I stopped saying that I'm not sure. I cannot announce that I should announce that I'm not sure. I won't announce what will happen before I announce because that's that's not the way. Well, just to make you feel a little better, Bob and Council Jubel asked this question, and you might have you know listened to other tapes. I can't recall anyone sitting where you are. They all say the same thing. At least I thought you, that I heard you say. Everybody gets at least two free shots. Okay, they're not sending them to prison. Uh, whether they should say it, they shouldn't say it. They all say it. Everyone who comes before us and you ask the same question about addiction, everyone says the same thing. My question is, and I asked it to someone last time, okay, so your inclination, to use your word, is to give them a free pass, first violation, second violation. I wouldn't say free pass. Free pass with that respect to incarceration. incarceration. So with respect to incarceration, you're inclined to give someone a free pass the first time and a free pass the second time. With respect to incarceration. With respect to incarceration. So my question is, what about this other defendant? Okay, he's a uh, assault and battery, deadly weapon, whatever he's got. And he's got Term suspended sentence, two years probation, check in with the probation officer every three months. Guess what? He violates. He doesn't show up. So the probation officer says, Yep, yeah, Joe Schmo, he violated his terms of probation. I want the original sentence of two years incarcerated, wherever it was, so and so. I want that to be enforced. Now he's, he's uh, brought before you on a probation surrender. Nothing else, no other crimes. Are you going to give him a free pass the first time? Are you inclined to give him a free pass with respect to incarceration the first time? And then this, my follow-up question is, if the answer is yes, are you going to give him a free pass the second time with respect to incarceration? I don't know the answer to that. The circumstances of the case. Uh, I don't know the facts and circumstances surrounding well, my hat, I'll make it a real simple. He failed to, failed he to, failed to show up. A lot of times you have to show up, check in yeah. with probation. No other offense, no, no, uh, you know, not no, another B and E or another, you know, lawsuit. He didn't show up. I don't know what my approach would be to that. Uh, how about Who this? Would you? would you be? I'll use your word. Do you think you'd be inclined to give that person the free pass the first time against the recommendation of? No, I'd be inclined to listen to the lawyer explain why they think incarceration is not appropriate. Beyond that, I'd listen to both sides. I, I, I have it. I guess my
my problem is, and I have a great deal of respect for counsel, but every one of these nominees who sit in that seat, if they listen to the tape,